Watershed education in all the public schools, the free public service that we do. Uh, and also, I'm very aware, very much aware of Malama Aina and being the chair of the Energy Environment Committee. While we are very excited about uh, utilizing more renewable energy, we must always, always be careful that we that it is that precious Aina that we are protecting. Thank you, Senator Governor. Just so everyone, that, let me re-ask there. I kind of got confused with another question we're looking at. How do you practice Malama Aina? Does this practice influence your decision making? So yes, take the phone. Okay, uh, aloha. I'm uh, Dean Kalani Capaluto, and uh, I'm part Hawaiian, so I have it's in my blood to uh, take care of the land. Um, I uh, I do a little bit of hydroponics on the side, and I uh, I uh, grow uh, tilapia. Um, and uh, one of the things I'm uh, pushing for is the uh, GMO labeling. And uh, trying to get rid of, uh, you know, it's controversial the issue of GMOs, but uh, I am definitely uh, in favor of them labeling GMOs. And we got to look closely at uh, what they are doing up in Kunia as far as poisoning our uh, our farmland. So hopefully that answers your question. Adam. Okay, as I said before, um, when talking about the PLDC saying that the land is the most uh, precious resource that the state has, it's also the most precious, precious resource that we have as citizens here. And um, the way it, it would definitely affect my decision making and every decision I made if I were elected because that's the most precious, precious resource that we all have. And the way that I practice it is being that I'm someone who moved here from the mainland. I try to see myself, and I hope I always will see myself, as a guest here, and try and treat the land here and the state as if I were staying in someone else's home, and show that respect to it, and that's how it comes into my decision making as well. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, I express my Malama Aina by being in opposition of the whole Pili project. I support agriculture. I support the scenic site of our state. I don't want people pouring concrete on all the precious land that we have right now. That's the only land left for us, for our kids, to practice agriculture so we can pass by and see how what a beautiful island we have by looking at green, green areas rather than looking at track homes all over. So, Malama Aina, I would like Emma Beach to be the way it is. I don't want too many houses, traffic lights, paved road, and of course, we need those egglands to refurbish our aquifers. I don't want desalinated water. Thank you. Chris? Yes, um, I do practice Malama Aina, and yes, it will affect my decision making. Um, I am a local boy. I was uh, born in Hawaii, raised in Little Beach. <laughs> Um, I love the land, I love the ocean, you know, I go hiking, I go fishing, I do everything there is that the island has to offer. And, you know, um, when I see trash, the way I do it is uh, when I see trash on the ground, I pick it up. You know, um, I try to keep everything, you know, I want to keep Hawaii beautiful and 
keeping our ag land is also one way to do that. Because when you think of Hawaii, you think trees, you think beauty, you know, and um, if we pour concrete on everything, you know, make a concrete jungle, you know, put houses everywhere, all over the place, you know, we, we won't have that same image, you know, we won't um, have the tourism that we do, you know, we can't share our culture with everybody. So, yeah, that's how I practice. Thank you, I, I don't think you're going to get any no's on this uh, question. <laughs> like I said, I was <laughs> When uh, my wife and I moved in, we had like one tree in our yard. We have now like about 15. We have a, and, and Mike, we have a breadfruit tree, so we're semi self sustaining at our house uh, agriculture. So, I mean, we try and do our best we can. We recycle, we do the same things as, as you folks. Thank you. You ready? Um, it's all about action. I've had four town hall meetings on your right to know what's in your food. Genetically modified organisms. I've championed it at the city council. The city council, the vote was eight to one. I was the one that said you had a right to know. I didn't give up. And then when we had three or four hearings down the road, I championed. Why? Not me, you. You showed up in droves at the Poly Golf Course. I've made about 20 YouTubes on this. And we got this measure passed. So when you talk about the land, what are they doing to the land? I have a development plan hearing the other night. Only Dean and I were the only two. This was a hearing at Copley Holly for all of us. Dean and I were the only ones that showed up. Uh, when we're talking about what you're going to do to the land, camping, the only council member that voted against raising camping fees, implementation of park user fees. Because your relationship to the Aina, your relationship with your family, sports team activities is going to your local parks. Pretty much sometimes when you work two jobs, that's the only chance you get to have a relationship with the land. And I made sure that you weren't penalized for that. And I've stood out at the council fighting for you. Well, first I want to respond to the previous talk from my opponent that said that I was not present at that PLDC uh, vote. I have a perfect attendance record in the House of Representatives. The reason I missed that one vote at that one moment is because I was slipped a paper that said that my grandmother was dying. And so I want everyone to know why I was not there. Of course, I practice with Mama Aina. I love this land. I'm a canoe paddler, a stand-up paddler. I am a swimmer. And I definitely love this land, and I'm so proud to be here. I use solar energy in my house, and I drive a hybrid car, and I'm a biker. So I do everything we can to make sure that we do not hurt our Malama Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry about the confusion that one. This next question. We'll start with uh, Dean. You will approach it in different ways. Those who are actually representing this for us now, and then also, of course, those that, are, that want to become representatives. Can you stop the city from placing a bus stop and shelter in front of or near the front door? If you need to have it removed, can they trust on you to work with towards that? And also, can you have it removed? If not, why not? This is actually a personal situation that's come up in the board for one of our community members. So I wanted to do, everybody wants to know how you would answer that. So once again, the question is, can you stop the city from placing a bus stop or shelter in front of their front door? If you need to have it removed, can you support them on that? And then also, can you have it removed? If you cannot, why not? <laughs> well, that's a difficult question, because I'm having I have a hard time understanding it, to be honest with you. Um, but I believe that uh, if there's a bus stop sitting right in front of somebody's house, and they're, they're not able to sleep at night, or, you know, or, or losing sleep because it's too close, or there's a noise issue, then, uh, yeah, we need to figure out a way to, to move the bus stop to a, uh, a better location because, uh, you know, this is all about uh, respecting people's individual rights. Thank you. Adam? Yeah, I agree. If, um, if, if the bus stop is already there and it's causing problems for the residents, obviously, I'm, I'm not sure if there's a state law, you know, on the books that would allow... Um, the legislature to do anything about it. If there were, I would definitely look into it, depending on the situation. 
And if there weren't, I would at the very least advocate you know, for that resident at the city and county level if it was really under their purview and there was something that they could do about it. Thank you. Brett Cornell? Yes, I think I have a personal knowledge about this issue. Um, the bus stop was next to that house, hardly used bus stop. And the only reason why she wanted an out in there is because she cannot open her window. And uh, I said, then close your drain. And she said, she, she doesn't want to open her, she, she wants to open her window, she doesn't want to close her drapes, and, and she's the only one that was bothered with it. I went and visited everybody in the neighborhood, does that bus stop bother you? And nobody else except that one person, because she just don't want a bus stop near her house. And I think that's not fair to the taxpayer to move a bus stop to in front of another house just because you don't like it. Uh, well, um, if a community, if a concerned citizen come up to me with that situation, I would do my best to help them, um, work with them. You know, just like Adam said, I'm not sure if there is a type of uh, law that we have that can allow us to just move a bus stop. But um, I would do my best to work with the person or at the community association to try and solve the problem. You know, in a way, in a, in a a way that benefits everybody. But I also do see the point that uh, Representative Camilla is making that, um, you know, she has um, for just one person to want to change something that everyone else likes. You know, it really depends on the, the whole picture of the situation. But then I would do my best to serve the community um, and try to find a solution that you know, um, helps everybody. Bob? Thank you. Uh, you know, when you're a uh, an elected official, your job is everything. And what I mean by that is whatever your constituents ask you to do, because as someone up here said, you work for them, they pay your salary. I once had someone, this is a true story, bring a straight dog to my house. And it wasn't a small dog. This is years ago when I was in the state legislature. Hey, we found this dog. We brought it. What do you say? Uh, well, don't give it to me. Well, no, of course. I said, okay, I'll take care of it. Put the dog in the truck, drove to the pound. That's what you do. So, with regarding the bus issue, this is absolutely a city issue, but you have to address it. So I got it. I'll talk to to the city council person over here and see what we can do, and we will work together on it. And then you find out, well, they did an engineering study and nobody's complaining, and or this person who lives there in front of the house has some behavior problems or whatever it may be. So but you address it to your fullest, but it is a city issue. It's not dodging it, you have to, to but your responsibility as a state representative is to carry that person into the city, get them with the, okay, Thank you, Bob. Since we're doing rebuttals, I just happened to go online and do a fact check on what my opponent just said, that she missed only one vote and it happened to be a crisis, and she missed a slew of votes on May 3rd, uh, not one. Not so, you know what the question is? It's about telling the truth. And when you tell the truth, you have nothing to worry about. And that's what, that's what Ms. Calacchini was all about. She took on City Hall. There's a gentleman here who wanted to have the bus stop removed. And he wanted to take on City Hall. And he went to this board using the board as a conduit. Well, I'll tell you what. On this rail project, one person came and said, you were supposed to do an archaeological inventory survey, and one person, she filed a lawsuit, and she won. My recommendation is to bypass this board, and if you want to have a bus stop be successful, you come to the city council, and I'll champion it with you. We can't be, you can't beat City Hall. When you have someone you love dying, sometimes you're gone for more than just a minute. He is so cool. Just let it go. Move on. Let it, let it. There you go. How would you handle the, the community situation about someone came to with the bus stop? Well, I think this question was brought to us because our council member has failed to address this issue with his constituent. He is in charge of bus stops. If I was a council person, I will do everything I can to help this person. I've helped people before, but I'm not the councilwoman. So when we call the city uh, bus people, 
They say, well, you have no authority over me. So I will do everything that we can. And we're really trying to help one constituent right now. Actually, there's several constituents. One problem is none of the people on the street want this bus stop. So what do you do? It's a very difficult situation. Thank you, Senator Gabbard. Remarks of uh, Bob McDermott in the record. Bob's been there. We all know this. Uh, constituent concerns. You do the best that you can. And I think that what people really appreciate is they see that you are actually trying your best to help them. There may be some merit. There may be not any merit. Uh, because I served on the city council for two years, I still have a lot of relationships with department uh, agencies and the people that still work over there. So when we get a city quote unquote issue. We call them up over there, we try to get all the facts that we can, and just try to do the best that you can. Thank you, Senator. For me, um, I think one of the biggest issues with our parks statewide is homeless, especially those parks on the beach. And my issue is that no one really seems to be addressing both the needs of the homeless and the needs of the residents in those beach park areas, because a lot of the homeless have appropriated those parks and started living in them and the local people cannot use them. So for me, my biggest issue would be helping those people off the beach. And, um, you know, it needs to be a combination of not just social services like IHS where I work, but also law enforcement and a collaboration between the two so that we get the people off the beach into the services they need um, and let them know that they're not allowed to stay there if they're not willing to take those services. Um, and if we do that, then we'll also be helping the local residents in those areas who are not being allowed to use the beaches, basically, because the homeless are, are encamped there. Thanks. Thank you. Rep. Uh, we definitely need a lot more parks. Parks for every um, age group. You know, little kids, uh, adolescents, and adults. And on my former site, which is uh, from Kolowaka up, I think we have a lot of parks there. But I think from this town, especially on Ocean Point, they could use a lot more park. Um, they, you know, there's a lot of young families there. So one of the things that I would advocate is more parks, especially for little kids. And when I walked the district, one of the things they wanted was more parks. Okay, Okay, well, um, my sentiments are quite similar to Mr. Rieger's, but also um, when it comes to parks, you know, by going to all the public parks over the island, I've seen that, you know, I would, you know, um, have a better maintenance of the facilities. You know, I would uh, encourage that, you know, like, um, be kept cleaner, you know, uh, maybe lock the bathrooms at night so that homeless don't sleep inside, you know. Um, it's because, you know, like, if you've ever been to the park at night and you run in there to use the bathroom because you're too far from home, you know, and then you, you come across a homeless person in there and it's quite awkward and, you know, like, I think that honestly think, um, you know, it just needs to be better security in a park. You know, like, a uh, park is for children to play, um, for families to spend time together, you know, and if there's um, homeless people there that are keeping you from using the park for what it's supposed to be used for, then there's something wrong with that. So I would definitely have more security to keep the homeless people out and help them to find somewhere else. But as we know, some home, some homeless people, they just, they don't want to be helped. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. There are, two, there are the differentiation between parks. Of course, you have city parks and you have state parks. So a state representative would look at the state parks. If you go down here to the city park and you see that it's in disrepair, you'll write a letter to the city council person, and if a constituent brought up, you'd give them a copy of it. I made uh, so-and-so aware of it, and Mike said you got to follow up on that. Uh, we have uh, 
I remember Sand Island State Park, when it opened, it was pristine, it's beautiful. That's a state park. Now, you know, if you go down there, there's one shower pipe, the rest are capped off. They don't fix them. I don't understand that. I've never understood that. And that goes to a larger challenge. Thank you. I sure wish I could put a bus stop in a park. I'm chair of Parks and Cultural Affairs. I'm not chair of the Department of, uh, rather, the uh, Transportation Department. And unfortunately, when you're talking about bus stops, the city and county, and I'm coming around to parks, the city and county has taken $214 million away from you with rail. To balance rail, they've taken your bus stop, bus service. So that's the truth. That's why the city and county doesn't want to help the bus rider. Okay? It's bleeding us dry for this rail. That's the truth. But because I'm chair of parks, I can tell you this. We have, and, and you'll be calling Director Cabado a liar if you say otherwise right here tonight. They have the city and county. I've inherited a problem along the Leeward Coast. And the city and county of Honolulu, under my watch as chair, we have every single park on the Leeward Coast being restored by the end of this year. And the big problem parks by the end of next year. So the fiscal cycle has been budgeted to repair every single park. Now, when I talked to Director Cabato and I said, somebody had said, you're not fixing the parks, he'd sure like to talk to that person Thank because it's an program. untruthful statement. We've championed our parks, friends, and you, you're going to see it right around the corner. When I first got elected, there were 400 crack addicts and drug dealers living at Ornitula Beach Park. They were hookers and pimps using the Kuuloa bathrooms. The people in our community were not using the parks. As the chair of the We Can See Neighborhood Restoration, the first act that I did as state representative is I put my foot down and said this is unacceptable. Within a year, we took our beaches and our parks back. You can go to Kuuloa today, and thank you for the great work of people like um, our, our, our Lions Club here, you can enjoy the parks. Now, Civil Beat says that the parks on the Lever Coast are the worst in the whole island. And Tom Berg, as he mentioned, is the chair of the parks team. Thank you, Senator Gabbard. Well, as far as the parks issue, um, you know, when folks are using the parks, they really don't know or care whether it's a county or a state park, a city or a state park. They just want the shower heads to work or whatever. And that's where you guys come in. Uh, we take every phone call, email, snail mail very seriously as far as the follow-up. And But if we don't hear, and this is, you know, my opponent was kind of attacking me for sending out a questionnaire. I mean, I need to hear from you what the issues that are important to you. If it's parks, if it's, you know, whatever, you need to let me know so we can act on what those concerns are. Obviously, one of the things that's in the news right now, they're locking up the bathrooms at, uh, down in uh, uh, Waikiki, and, and tourists are, are like freaking out, but how do you solve that problem? And again, the whole thing is collaboration and working together calmly and trying to come to a good solution that's gonna benefit not only the local community, but also the tourism, or the tourists who come here. Thanks, Senator. Dean? Hello. Uh, I'm uh, lucky to uh, have grown up and uh, uh, from sun up to sundown when I was uh, a kid, uh, I spent the majority of my time in parks. And I'm sad to see that uh, my children don't have the same opportunity that I had. And you see the youth of today, and uh, you know, they don't have that same opportunity to go out and, and play ball all day and, and, and get into shape. So. Um, my problem with some of the parks is uh, uh, nobody wants to go into a restroom that doesn't have uh, toilet paper or soap. That's just uh, unacceptable. And then, uh, you know, no paper or for your hands. But uh, I'd love to have more parks, but at the same time, we have to have the money to support them. If we can't maintain it, then we sh probably shouldn't build it. At the same time, if we get new construction projects here that build homes, they, we, need to, we need to make sure they put parks in and put the schools in and the infrastructure in first before they add uh, new uh, homes. Thank Thanks. you. 
This next question is community concern focused towards Senator Gabbard. It's a question. Where are we on the leeward bike path in its development? Oh, leeward bike path. Let me know when you're ready, then I'll start the questions. Here we go, Lakewood Bike Path. Phase one, Westlock area, 4.2 miles. The start of construction is October of 2013 and completed by October 2014. At least that's the latest that we have on that. Anything else you wanted to add about anything else personally? Again, what I just said, folks, you bikers, including the rep on my left, if this is an issue that's really important to you, uh, and also, uh, Rep. Cavanito referred to this earlier. You know, when, when people show up at hearings, when they you, you contact us, your elected representatives, and you start turning up the heat, uh, at least for ourselves, myself, we, we try our best to, uh, you know, if I get 100 phone calls about bike paths, I'm yelling at my chief of staff, Rock Riggs, back there, and I said, what's going on? So it's really important. Uh, I know there's kind of a tendency to say, ah, damn. Anything, but you know, it, it, it doesn't do anything unless you get involved, and that's what participatory democracy is all about. Uh -huh. Thanks, this is brought up a little bit by earlier when Adam started it for the other question we had about the parks. Share your thoughts on the homeless problem here in Eva, possible causes. I think it's self-induced for economics and what can we do about them? We'll begin with Rita. Yes, I'm the chair of housing and I'm about uh, the homeless issue. The homeless issue is a very, very complicated one. That, yes, we want to take, uh, as a matter of fact, we appropriated $183 million for them. We're having a public hearing on the 23rd to, for everyone that have received money, part of that 183 million to let us know what it is, how they spent that money towards the homeless. And uh, there is no, so we'll hear from them what they did with it. There is no one fixed solution to homelessness. One of my disappointments at this chair of housing was that every time I find the money for them, the whole community comes up and says, not in my own back. So we have solutions, we just need the community to buy into it and be a part of that solution. Thank you, Rep. Chris? Before you start my time, can you repeat the question one more yeah. time? Share your thoughts on the homeless problem, possible causes with self-induced, the possible economics, and what you would do about it as a representative. Did you get it? Yes. Okay. I'm doing great. Well, um, my thoughts on the homeless is that, um, you know, growing up in Hawaii, um, I think a lot of, majority of the homeless is self-induced. A lot of it is um, drug addicts just are just far gone, you know, but then they just, they want, they, they don't want help because they just want to keep doing their drug. Um, and that's a sad sight, you know, and those kind of people, they're extremely hard to help because they can't be helped until they want to be helped. And they're going to continue being you know, light on the community and you know um, I'm not sure how to handle that kind of situation but then I will definitely try to collect it I will definitely try to work with different organizations to try and see if we can find some kind of way to um, put it, uh, housing for these people and also um, you know with the, with the current situation you know I think um, with all the programs that they're out there out there you know like the emergency shelters Transitional housing. You know, if someone is homeless and they don't want to be homeless, um, there's a lot of programs to help them so that they can um, restart their lives. And those are the people that I think that you know um, we should be looking for and definitely helping with um, mothers and families. Thank you. Thank you. We have had the homeless with us since uh, Jesus's time, and uh, we haven't found a solution yet. <laughs> you have the marginal homeless. Uh, family that uh, you know just gets 
evicted or whatever. They're easy to help. They want to get help. There's emergency programs. There's funding for that. You can help them. Where you have a real challenge is the psychological, the mental illness. If people don't want to take their medicine, you can't force them. And if they want to live in a different dimension, where they don't bathe and they live under the bridge, you can't stop them. You can move them away from the bridge and they just travel on somewhere else. Chris was right about the drugs and booze. People don't quit till they want to quit. They just don't. You got to touch their soul. It's got to be a spiritual solution and government is not equipped to do that. And then some people just want to chill on the beach. They don't want to pay rent. They don't want to pay electricity. That's probably maybe 20, 25%. They want to collect the, the funding, but they don't want the responsibility. You folks all have bills every month, electric, car bill, all these different, you're scratching your helmet, you're making it every month. They'd rather not. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Councilman Burke. I just want to let everyone know that uh, Mayor Carlisle's administration canceled and put zero money in the Leeward Coast Benefit Package. We, we fought and got $3 million in two fiscal cycles to bring $3 million into parks, specifically to parks. And I wrote it. I made sure that the youth team, see when you use the parks, you engage everybody. And I wanted to make sure that we weren't left behind. So we championed something no one else has done, especially when the administration said no, we got $3 million. Here's a bill for an ordinance that I got passed unanimously, and again, I is we. And this is 12-74, but it's a bill. Resolutions in the city council is different than the state house. This bill amends the land use ordinance to do this. Let's grow families, not weeds. So when I first took office, I saw all the homeless living in the beach parks. And what we did is we said, let's do affordable housing. And we got passed unanimously just for the lead work coast to take those that are most destitute in the challenging times, that they can get in some type of a housing project where the private sector runs it and not government. The council just voted today to liquidate 12 properties and get City Hall out of Thank you, Councilman. housing. My project puts it back into your domain, private sector. All right. Say it's Paul's place. Well, like Adam, I've had the privilege of working at a homeless shelter. In my case, uh, I work at Neos, so that's a homeless shelter for veterans, especially Iraq and Afghanistan veterans who have post traumatic stress disorder. Right now, I'm working with U.S. Vets and the YWCA to ensure that women veterans have a separate place to stay. And we'll be making that big announcement very soon. We'll be opening a specialized veterans uh, center for just women only. The 400 people that we picked off um, the parks, I personally helped through the help with Governor Lindell's emergency proclamation to finally help to build emergency housing. It was the first time we had the funds to do it. What we need to do now, and if I am elected city councilwoman, we would now shift the change instead of the emergency housing to permanent affordable housing. Right now, what's happening in either from our hospitals or jails or people who lose their homes, they're going straight, they're being released right back into homelessness because they can't stay at the temporary shelters very long. And the reason they go back to homelessness uh, right away is because they're in no affordable housing. Thank you very much. Senator Gabbard. When I was on city council representing District 1, there were 1,700 homeless on the Wainai Coast, 400 of those were kids. And Bob is right, we're not going to solve this one overnight. One of the best things that's happening right now, though, is, and he alluded to it as well, and that is a partnership between churches and government. We have a, a, a <coughs> Korean church out there on the Wainan Coast. We bought some land. They're actually making that available to farm that land for homeless people that want to come there and actually work and get paid. And so I think if more of the faith-based communities step up to the plate, to help address this problem. Working with government as far as human services, we can really do something very productive on this issue. Thanks, Senator. Well, it's one thing to talk about helping the homeless, and it's another thing to actually uh, have some action uh, and not just a bunch of, you know, uh, uh, for about the last four or five years, uh, uh, our family's been involved in something called Auntie Lynn's uh, Slipper Project, which we go out to Wainai. And we go down all the beaches and hand out food and clothing, and uh, we visit the shelters. And I tell you what, it's a humbling experience. Anybody who's ever been out there is would totally be shocked. Uh, you've got you know children out there, and you're like, I cannot believe these kids are running around out there barefoot, you know, 
you know, some of them don't even have clothes. But um, anyway, the, the shelters are not the only answer because the shelters are not at full capacity. So, you know, just saying that just throw shelters at is not, not the solution. And um, I think we need to handle the, the homeless on a case-by-case -case basis. So you, you really have to get out there in the field and uh, talk to them. And uh, some of these folks that are out there on the beach are Hawaiian sovereignty folks. You know, they just want to live in peace on the land that they think is their own. So, uh, other than that, do I have any more time? Thank you, Dean. Good Good time. Time. Okay. okay, like I said, I work at IHS and I work with the homeless every single day. Um, I believe at the last count we had about 6,000 homeless statewide in the state of Hawaii. And they're broken up into three basic groups. The first group is people with substance abuse and mental illness. The second one is people who just can't find affordable housing, which is a huge problem for everyone. And the third is a group of people who simply don't want to either go into the shelters because there are too many rules there, or uh, they just see it as an easy way out to live on the beach because they feel like it. So a big problem is that we're not addressing these three issues separately. Everyone comes up with appropriations, appropriations. Let's have money. And like Dean said, uh, the shelters, I work at the largest homeless shelter in the state, and we are never full. I asked the woman at the front desk, she's worked there for 15 years, how many times did we turn people away because we had no space? She said, not once. The entire 15 years I've worked here. So a huge missing piece, I feel, is universal enforcement of our, of our laws. Because if people know that they're not going to be allowed to stay on the beach, that's going to take care of that one third that simply wants to stay there because it's easy. And that'll take care of a huge part of it. And then, um, you know, keep continue to work with the social services like IHS and Catholic Charities and the other ones who work with the homeless. Thank you. Our next question. If elected, what can you do for funding for our Kapuna? What can you do for funding for our Kapuna? Chris, I'll start with you. Well, if elected, um, when it comes to funding for our kapuna, well, I first start by um, not raising their cost of living. Um, you know, a lot of our kapuna live on fixed incomes. And, you know, that income that they get, that's you know, pretty much what they have to work with for the entire month. So I wouldn't um, make it harder for them. To, so that's the first thing to start with, you know. And, um, I'm not too sure what else I could do, you know, like, I, our kapuna is, um, they're our elders, and, you know, we kind of respect them and, you know, uh, to help them in any way possible, um, but, you know, maybe coming up with some kind of uh, appropriation to give them, or some kind of tax break, but, again, you know, that's, um, can't do, can't really make it, I don't want to even promise it, because, um, that's something that, you know, there's, a um, to get the entire state house to agree with. So um, I am willing to help in any way possible, but then one thing I can say for sure is that I would be against any type of uh, increase in their cost of living or something to take away from their fixed incomes. Thank you, Chris. Bob? Yeah. That was a rather broad question. Uh, so uh, Chris did, did a good job trying to answer that. Uh, cost of living, I would agree. No taxes on pensions. I wouldn't support any taxes on pensions or retirement. But that was brought up last year. You know, one of the reasons we have so many military folks retire here is because the military pension is tax-free. And we would lose a lot of those folks. Second thing, I guess I would nail it down to is some sort of long-term care vehicle where we can target uh, care for the elderly. Something if we could figure out a revenue neutral scheme to do that. When I was in the state legislature, that was one issue, I'm telling you. I had elderly people come from my district and say, we really need this. It was just a couple bucks a day to help them get visits and wellness checkups. But they really, you know, one of the things was apathy we were talking about here. People actually came to your office and said, please, we need help. I have my auntie, my cousin. And so I supported it. That was uh, very moving. And the faith-based organization supported it, too. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Council Member Bird. We need to be honest here. Rail is the biggest factor in everyone's lives. 
sewer rates going up, water, and it's because of the rail. They've raised the debt ceiling on all the services of core functions of government. Everything that we do is being increased due to fund this rail. 450 million line of credit, four and a quarter percent interest on 1.9 billion in bonds. And I think of the Kapuna who are paying a rail tax costing them thousands of dollars up until the year 2022. This is the most egregious, harshest tax in the history of our county. This rail tax. If you want to help the Kapuna, you stop this rail and you take care of the utilities. I've introduced a resolution to break up the monopoly on the electricity rates. We have a monopoly on electricity. That's one of the biggest factors for everybody here. So if you want to help out seniors, Simple. Stop the rate. Thank you, Justin Lindbergh. Red Pine. I'm glad um, Bob mentioned um, the tax and pensions. I was so proud to be part of a, a small group of legislators that fought tooth and nail to make sure that uh, the governor's um, proposal to tax elderly pensions was stopped, and we successfully did that this last year. Uh, I was also proud to with uh, Senator Gabbard. Uh, to help build different housing, both in the Catholic area as well as throughout the Eastern Coast. And uh, I also voted against every time when someone proposed the increase in the general excise tax. Uh, my opponent says that the rail tax is the largest in history and hurts Kapuna the most, but he introduced the same tax, House Resolution 11249, to tax the people the same as rail for uh, highways and bikeway construction for his transportation plan. So that really hurts Kapuna. The general excise tax raises uh, your food, your rent, uh, your, your gas. And so I would never, ever support a tax increase like this. Thank you very much. Senator Gabbard. On the uh, pension tax, I sit on the Judiciary Committee in the Senate. And going back to what I was saying earlier, when we had the hearings, there were uh, standing room only, Kupuna who showed up to testify, and it really made a difference, and that's why we were able to stop that, as far as convincing the members of the committee that it was not good to move forward. So I also uh, am very supportive of the Kapuna Caucus that is uh, led by our, one of our senators, uh, Brickwood Gallateria from Waikiki. Uh, I don't feel like it, you know, the meals on wheels, the different programs serving our Kapuna, this, we, we should never be cutting back on these very important programs. Dean. Aloha. Our society is judged by our ability to take care of the uh, KP, the Kapuna, and those that are sick. I think uh, the families that work uh, two to three jobs, and uh, they're also having to take care of uh, someone that's sick. And uh, you know what? Our, I think our society right now, our community is at a breaking point, many of us. Um, and uh, so, I wouldn't add anything uh, additional to what we're already carrying. The load is already there. We're already stretched to the limit. Um, so in our Kapuna, they just want to live with dignity. And, uh, you know, and we need to learn from them. I mean, they're there. But, you know, we're supposed to listen to what they have to say. So um, I would uh, support anything that uh, uh, supports our Kapuna and uh, allows them to live, uh, live out. Uh, the rest of their, their lives uh, in dignity. Hello. Adam? I'm actually going to agree with Chris on this one. Uh, for me, the biggest problem facing our Kupuna is cost of living because most of them are on a fixed income. They don't have a lot of money. Most of them are in similar situations to the families that I deal with every day. They're just barely on the edge, just barely making it in one mischeck away from becoming homeless or living with family on a couch or something. So I feel that one thing the state's doing that it's been doing for years and years every single year is increasing taxes and fees. This last session, even though the GET was not increased, there were all types of small taxes and fees that were increased that were slipped in. They were trying to raise uh, fees for marriage licenses, fees for getting a copy of your birth certificate, which affected um, OHA because Native Hawaiians need to get copies of their birth certificates often to prove um, you know, blood right and everything. So these types of taxes and fees that are just little by little every single year, and I saw them pass through the committees that I sat in when I was at the legislature, I feel that a lot of the legislators are not treating the people's money as if it were their own money. 
and that's what's hurting our pupuna and the rest of the population as well. Thank you, Yes, I have to say that at the legislature, and I've been there eight years, the Kupunas there are well represented. They have AARP, that's walking the holes all the time. They have Kupuna caucus. So, but if you're welcome to join them, if you want to, I mean, they are a very strong group and they're a good block of voters. So I don't have any concerns about them not being represented at the Capitol. But I want to address my, my time with the pension for retirees. There is something that's, that's, that line was not completed. It's pension for retirees who make $250,000 a year adjusted income. That's 3% of the population. That was what that bill was. But the politics of fear came in, and they told everybody that every retiree, their pension is going to be taxed. It's $250,000 adjusted income, 3% of the population. Those kupunas that have apartment buildings own Lee jets, they own so much that they have an adjusted income of $250,000. That's what the bill was targeting. If you are a retired military, and making $70,000 a year, and then you have uh, a state retiree of another $60,000, that's only $130,000. You are below that benchmark. Thanks, Dr. Vanellis. 